Let's take a look at how the Linux kernel runs executables. The way new programs execute on Linux is by calling execv, which is a special system call which causes the calling process to switch to a different program. And you can see it's pretty simple. You pass in the path that you want to execute, arguments, and the environment block. Let's give a simple example. So if I run strace over here, which lets us trace system calls, and I'm gonna filter specifically for execv calls. Now let's run this on, for example, on who am I? Simple program that should print near, which is my name. And you can see how execv is called over here with the full path to who am I? The arguments are over here, and this is the environment block. And finally, the output is just near, as expected. So as you can see, I have here cloned the Linux repository. And we're gonna go ahead and start by building a kernel which we can debug with GDB. And for this, I'm gonna start with make def config. And this will create a default configuration. Afterwards, let's run make many config. And I'm gonna change here a couple of stuff. First of all, let's go here to process type and features. And let's go ahead and disable randomize the address of the kernel image. And reason I wanna disable this is this will mess up with GDB because GDB is expecting the kernel to be loaded in a fixed address in memory. And this is a security feature, but it's gonna mess up with GDB. So I'm just gonna disable this for this video. Now using tab, I'm gonna exit. Now let's disable a couple of stuff that I don't need. For example, virtualization, I'm gonna disable this. Just press space on this. Also no need for loadable module support and also networking, no need for that. Finally, I wanna go ahead and enable a couple of debugging options. So let's go to the bottom over here and press on kernel hacking. First, I'm gonna click on compile time checks and compiler options. Click here on debug information and I'm gonna press space on rely on the toolchain's implicit dwarf version. Next, I'm gonna enable the provide GDB scripts for kernel debugging. And now we're done with this section. I'm gonna to go to generic kernel debugging instruments. And here I'm gonna enable the KGDB kernel debugger. That's it for the configuration. So I'm gonna just exit and save the changes. Now I'm gonna run make to build a kernel with minus J with four. So it's gonna split this to four jobs. It's gonna make it faster. Just adjust it to whatever fits for you. Okay, nice. We can see that everything was successful. BZ image is ready. By the way, I'm gonna put information in the description on how you can do all this setup on your computer. Another small thing that we need to run is make scripts GDB. Now let's go make the init ramifs because we want to put bash over there and also a small program that I'm going to write that we're going to just see how it runs. So for this, I'm going to go to my fun directory. And as you can see over here, I have bash over here. So I just downloaded the source code of bash and let's go and build that. First of all, I'm going to configure it to be a static build. This is important because I want to keep everything statically linked. I don't want to have any dynamic executables, so we won't need any dynamic libraries and it'll make the setup as simple as possible. So let's run the configure script over here and pass in help. Specifically, I'm looking for an option that is related to static. And you can see over here, link bash statically. So let's use this option. Afterwards, I'm just gonna run make to build bash. Again, I'm gonna use minus J4. Okay, so we can see everything was successful. We're supposed to have bash over here. So let's take a look. And here it is, here's bash. So I'm gonna go back one directory and just move bash from over here to here and just call it init. This is gonna be our init process on my system. Now let's build another simple program that we're gonna run using bash. So let's call this hello.c. And I'm gonna use the write system call to write something on the screen. You can see this writes to a file descriptor. I'm gonna start by including unistd as specified over here. And then I'm gonna call write. First, I'm gonna pass one, that's gonna be std out. Afterwards, the buffer, let's just write nice, the new line. And finally, the count. So how many characters are in this string? Six characters. Afterwards, let's call exit to exit from the process. And we're going to pass in a status number that is going to be indicative 0xA4. Just something that we'll clearly see in the assembly when we're taking a look at the disassembly of this. And I'm going to build this with a couple of special flags. So first of all, GCC. We're going to make this a static build, so mine is static. Output is going to be hello. Also, I'm going to pass in a specific entry point, and the entry point is going to be main. Reason for that is that I want an execution of the program to start from our main function and not from like a generic C library main function. So it'll be clear when we're looking at the disassembly that it's going to be our code. And you're going to see this later when we're going to debug the kernel. Finally, passing in the C file we just wrote. Now we have both the hello executable here and in it. Just checking to see that works. 
and it works nicely. By the way, we can make sure that these are statically linked and not dynamic by just running LDD. LDD with hello, for example, and same with init. Now let's make out of both of these an init ramfs that we can use with the kernel. For this, I'm gonna use CPIO, but first I need to list the files that I wanna include in the archive. So I'm gonna to wanna to include hello. Let's pass this into a file that we call list and also in it. And now list should look something like this. And we're gonna pass this into CPIO. Dash O is gonna create a new archive, minus H new C. This is the format that the kernel supports. And finally pass this into init.cpio. And now this is ready for the kernel. Just a small thing that we need to configure in GDB. We're gonna to need to add a special line into a GDB init file in our home directory. I already did this on my system, just consider clone Linux as a safe path. So GDB will be able to load scripts from this directory. Now let's go ahead and boot the system that we just built. So I'm gonna use QEMU for this, x86.64. First of all, let's pass in the kernel. Now I'm gonna make a new line over here. Let's pass the init ramfs that we built. And finally, I'm also gonna pass minus s. This will cause QMU to boot in debug mode so we can connect with GDB. Now I can see it's booting up and we drop into bash. So this is good. Now let's connect with GDB to this. So I'm gonna run here GDB and then VM Linux. And now I'm gonna run in GDB target, remote, one, two, three, four. And now I'm successfully connected. Let's take a look at the source code for a sec. And I'm gonna open the source of fs slash exec.c. fs, by the way, stands for file system. Anyway, let's jump to the syscall define. So this is a macro that is used to add new system calls to the kernel. Specifically, I'm gonna go to define three because exec v has three parameters, file name, argv, and environment. And here it is, exec v. Now, what does it do? It just calls do exec v. So let's put the breakpoint on this function, do exec v. I'm gonna use the b command here and then pass in the function. And now you can see we have a breakpoint over here. So I'm just gonna continue execution by running C. Now going back over here, I'm gonna run my program hello that we just wrote. And it dropped on the breakpoint. So I'm gonna just continue stepping inside by running S. And I'm gonna skip a couple of stuff. So I'm gonna use S to step inside and N to go to the next instruction without diving into functions. Now I'm gonna use N over here. It's doing a couple of initialization stuff like allocating the BPRM. BPRM stands for binary program. So it's just a structure that is used to represent the binary program that we want to run. Now it's counting the number of arguments. So argc is the number of arguments passed into argv and it's storing it in the BPRM. By the way, let's take a quick look at how the BPRM looks like. So print and then BPRM. And we can see we have here a bunch of stuff in the structure, including for example, the program itself and file name. Here is hello that we just ran. So we know we're at, we're at the correct place. Let's now continue going forward. Now let's go ahead and dive into this function over here, bprm exec v. So I'm gonna use the s command, that's gonna be step into, and I'm gonna continue stepping inside. Here I'm gonna press n, and let's take a look at how this function looks like. So I'm gonna run the list command, and specifically I wanna take a look at what happens over here. So I'm gonna continue running enter to see more section of this program. By the way, let's put the focus on this window. Okay, let's skip to this line over here, which calls exec bin prm. So I'm gonna use advance for this and then the number. And now we're inside the exec bin prm function. Let's list it right now. And you can see what this does is start searching for binary handlers. So let's skip to this call over here, which searches for a binary handler for BPRM. And basically the idea here is that we don't know exactly what type of executable this file is, and the kernel needs to go ahead and search for how to handle it. For example, it can be an elf, or it can just be a script, for example, which starts with the shebang at the beginning. For example, if you want to use Python, maybe you would have something like this. And this will tell it to run Python to interpret the program. And this is actually parsed by the kernel. Our format is of course elf, so we expect to eventually get to a handling of an elf file. Let's go ahead and skip to this function call over here, search binary handler. And now you can see we're inside of the call over here, search binary handler. Let's take a look and list the function contents. And here's the interesting part. This is list for each entry. We get here the formats, 
and it's just going to go through all the formats and search for the correct format by running this function over here, load binary. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a breakpoint on this line over here, and we're going to follow the loop until we arrive at the L format handler. So I'm going to run breakpoint on this line number and continue execution. Okay, first time, let's check out the format handler right now. So I'm going to print FMT. And this is called the miscellaneous format. So this is irrelevant, so I'm going to continue. Now the format is the script format. So this is what I described earlier, the shebang over here. And this is also irrelevant for us. So I'm going to continue execution. And finally, we have the L format. So this is relevant for us. So I'm going to dive deeper inside. So I'm going to run step over here and just run next after it. And now we arrived at the function over here, load elf binary. So this is a very long function, but let's go ahead and just list it and take a look. So here the function starts and it just goes ahead and interprets the file and parses it. This is a pretty long function, so we're not going to go over the logic of the function, but basically it just parses the elf file, which is just essentially a binary executable structure. But we want to specifically focus on how the kernel will eventually go ahead and run the code. You know what, let's go ahead and just skip to this line. I'm going to show you the identification of the elf. So we have here the elf ex dot eident. And you can see over here the magic that identifies this as a correct elf file. Now let's go ahead and continue listing the file. So you can see that what this line does is essentially checks the magic that it matches the elf magic. Now let's go ahead and continue listing the function. So it's continuing here to parse the elf. And now after a lot of logic of parsing the elf, we're going to skip to this line over here, 1340, which calls the macro start thread. Now this is actually a confusing name because it doesn't actually start the thread. I want to dive into this call because this initializes the new registers of the CPU and it basically prepares execution for the new executable that was just loaded. So let's dive into that, passing in the line number over here. And now we're exactly at the line that we want. So I'm just going to use S to step into. And here we arrived at a start thread function. This is specifically for the architecture, by the way, as you can see over here. Let's list this. So it just calls start thread common. So I'm going to dive into the next call. And let's go ahead and list this. And take a look at this. It's initializing all kinds of registers. Let's take a look at the IP register, which actually stands for instruction pointer. So I'm going to go one line after it to 550. And now I'm going to print regs.ip. Let's print this in hex. Now this is very interesting because this is going to be the instruction pointer after we finish with the system call. This is supposed to correspond with the entry point of our new program. And let's take a look at that for a sec. So unrelated, I'm going to go back to my hello program that I just wrote. And let's open it with GDB. Now if I run info and then file, we're going to get some information about this executable. And take a look. This is the entry point over here. And this is the number in hex. And as you can see, it exactly corresponds with this number that we see over here in the regs.ip. This means that the Linux kernel is initializing the next instruction pointer to be for the entry point of hello. Now let's just continue going forward with next. And now we're finished with the load elf binary function. So we're back in the search binary handler. Let's list this. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to use the finish command. So we'll finish the current function. I want to go back to the original system call function. Let's finish this as well. And now let's list this place. You can see we're back in the syscall define three. This is the main definition of the system call. Let's continue listing this. And here it is. So we're just going to follow along this return and see what's going on. Let's continue from here. So I'm going to run next again. So it's starting to prepare the exit back to user mode from the kernel. And now we arrived at some assembly that is related to the system call. Now we arrived at common interrupt return. And take a look at this instruction over here. This is iretq. iret means interrupt return. Now it's going to go back to user mode. So running next over here. Now we're in user mode. Check out this address over here in memory. This is an address in user mode. If I go ahead and take a look at what is here with examine and then I, which is instruction, 
and then passing in RIP, which is the instruction pointer, we can see how we get a message here that it cannot access memory at this address. Now, why is that? The kernel uses a special technique which is called demand paging. Basically, this is not loaded into memory yet. It's, it needs to load this from disk. And this is just a cool technique to conserve memory on your random access memory. Now, how can we see this? If I just run ni, which is next instruction, you can see that now the kernel is handling a page fault. And this page fault happened because the user mode has tried to access an invalid address in memory. And this will cause the kernel to load this into memory. Now, after it finishes handling the page fault over here, it's gonna try executing this command again. So it's gonna go right back into this address in memory. So I'm gonna run advance here and pass in the address that we have over here. And now if we take a look at the instruction at RIP, the instruction pointer, we can see it's now valid. In fact, we can see all the instructions of our program, including the A4 over here, and this is the call to exit. Now to fully verify that this is the correct place, let's take a look at what is this address. But if I try reading it with x slash s, which s is string by the way, you can see again we cannot access the memory. That is because again we have this feature of demand paging, so the kernel is only going to load this into memory when it's actually used. Now to get access to this address in memory, we're going to have to advance after the call over here, because this is actually going to use this address. This is the call to write, by the way. So I'm going to advance to this address. And now again, if we take a look at the string, here it is. Now let's just continue execution. And you can see here the print of nice as well.